Hi, this is Frid from The Joy of Syntax and English in Colour. Although my company's name is The Joy of Syntax and English in Colour, and although I've written a book that's called The Joy of Syntax and I'm writing another one right now that's called um, English in Colour, I also teach German in Colour. And I'm also a very huge, enthusiastic vegan who shares with people the joys of vegan living. Today I want to start a course in German pronunciation. Pronunciation is the gateway to a language. When we are first conceived and are in the womb, we are not only surrounded by the sounds of other, our mother tongue, but also immersed in them and we are in fact vibrating with them. Um, sounds are mechanical waves, mechanical energy, and um, our bodies consist of water and mostly water and then a few solids and th these parts of us can vibrate with mechanical energy so when our mother talks or when we are surrounded by our mother tongue we are in fact vibrating with it and then slowly we develop our sense of touch and so we can touch the sounds and then we develop our sense of hearing. And by the time we're born, we have this thorough immersion experience and vibrational experience of our mother tongue. And then once we're born, we don't start speaking immediately. No, we see our mom or caregivers speak. So we hear our, our mother tongue, we see people using it, and usually the interaction with our mother tongue is a loving one and then we discover our organs of sound uh, of our uh, organs of speech and we play with them and then we make our first noises and then usually you know mom recites nursery rhymes and sings children's songs and then um, beautiful children's books are read to us and we start imitating what we hear and we learn the stuff by heart. So for the first six years of our lives, um, immersion and imitation and repetition are the, the main forces for creating our innate knowledge and understanding and, and linguistic ability. Um, but then, when we learn a new language, a foreign language, somehow the main channels that are used are our, our cognition and our eyes. And so there's, it's no wonder that we cannot learn another language at school. Um, we don't learn another language, you know, speaking for us Germans, we don't learn English in schools we learn English in spite of schools. We learn English because we start watching movies and we start reading books or we go abroad or whatever. Anyway, this is a long story. Um, I think I'm going to make a few YouTube videos about that. But today, I simply want to start teaching German pronunciation, the gateway to German. And by the way, I also um, teach English pronunciation. And I wrote two books, and hang on a second, I'll, I'll show them to you. I created sound alphabets. This is my sound alphabet for English. It's called Das Englische Klangalphabet. And I also have um, an English version, it's called Fritz Fun Inventory of the Sounds of English. And then I created this, um, this, German sound alphabet, das deutsche Klangalphabet, and uh, what I have done is I assigned, um, I focus on the sounds, and I teach you the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet. And um, so what I've done, I have assigned an, a, an image to each sound. Um, and for instance, I'll give you an example. The umlaut U has been given this word, Mühle, 
it's the, the most dominant sound in that word. So this word acts like a language gym in which you can practice the umlaut U. And it's also um, your mnemonic device that helps you remember physically and vis uh, mentally remember um, the word, uh, the sound U. And you can use the word to learn the, yeah, the spelling as opposed to the sounds of the word. So we can do, um, well, we can spell the word Mühle, but we can also really sound it out. In German, we can say, we, wir können das, Bu das Wort buchstabieren, we can spell it. Und wir können es klangstabieren. I invented that word, meaning we can, we can sound spell it. Okay, and I'm going to go, um, I'm going to do two things. First, I'm going to remind you of your organs of speech. And then I will lead you through the map of German sounds. And um, yeah, and, and you can practice with this video. And if you find this helpful and you want to have the book, you can buy the book as, a, as an ebook. And it comes with a video and an audio and a set of three posters. Yeah, and you can also book one-on-one -on -one sessions with me and eventually there will be an online class. But the following video series is free and I think you can do a lot with it. So let's get started, shall we? I share my screen. And today, okay. So uh, I actually think I won't, um, I won't um, do full screen because it's, it's helpful to see what's ahead. And I think this is big enough. So, Welcome to the language gym, <laughs> to this gateway to German. Okay, this is uh, a sagittal view of our organs of speech. Well, um, a few things are not on there. Of course, we need our lungs because we need air, we need the egressive airstream for producing English and German. And we need our um, muscles, the diaphragm and the, the, the intercostal muscles um, to, to breathe and to regulate the speech sounds. But other than that, we see everything we need on here. Um, there are, we, we have the, um, the larynx here, which is like a, a house, a little house made of cartilage. And in it live the vocal cords, also known as the vocal folds. And when these two come, the two vocal cords come together and we breathe out, they vibrate and then we have sound. So I invite you to place your hand on your Adam's apple here, on your larynx, and to simply feel the buzzing sound that your vocal cords make. So say, mmm, or ah, and then you feel the buzzing, buzzing sound here, and the buzz, buzz, buzz. And then I would like you to, to actually say um, the letter S, but say it once with voice and once without to really appreciate the difference between voiced and voiceless sounds. So go So you place the tip of your tongue up against the alveolar ridge, which is this little bump behind the teeth. And then you, you let the air stream pass through your mouth, you don't inhibit it. And you simply say so we don't feel feel buzzing action here, and we feel buzzing action in the larynx. Okay, so let's look at what we have here. We have 
um, our windpipe and the larynx with the vocal cords. And then here we have the oral cavity and here we have the nasal cavity. And they're both important for producing German and English sounds. Let's look at the oral cavity first. In it, we have the tongue, very important. And well, let's start from the outside. From the outside, we, we see our lips and then the teeth. And then behind the teeth, the upper teeth, there is the alveolar ridge, which is the little bump, which we need for sounds like t and d and s. And then behind that is the bony part of the palate. And then there is the soft part of the palate, which is also called the velum. And at the very end, there is a little itty bitty piece that's called the uvula. And then we have the lower lips and the lower teeth, the row of teeth. And then we have our tongue. And we see there's the tip of the tongue, the front, the back, and the root. Um, yeah. And then there's the nasal cavity, and we need that for certain sounds. Okay, as I said, all the sounds that English and German produce are produced on the airstream coming out of the body. Now, every now and then, we actually produce sounds on the air coming in, but that's not um, regular speech production. Sometimes people say, yeah, instead of yes, but that's just like a a tick or something. It's not normal speech necessarily and not everybody does that. Okay, so air comes out and air, the airstream is manipulated in some ways. And roughly speaking, we can say that there are two groups of words, um, of sounds in English and German. Consonants are sounds where you use your you use voice or not, and you produce all kinds of additional noises with your, your um, organs of speech. You manipulate the airstream in such a way that additional noise is produced, for instance. Um, and, and there are various ways we can go about that. We can actually stop the airflow and release it. And so, and we can stop the airflow at the point of the lips, for instance, when we say p as in penguin, then we stop the airflow with the lips. So the, we close our mouth, we have it closed for a split second, and then we open it up again, peng, and then we release the airstream. We can also squish the sound as we did when we said and then we have some friction, some hissing action going on. We can actually close off the mm, oral cavity and let the airstream come out of the nose, out through the nose. That's what we do when we say hmm, as in mom, or hmm, as in nose, or hmm, as in tongue. So, Notice what happens when I close off the nasal cavity. I say, hmm, air can't escape. And as soon as the air can't escape, it can't create sound with the, um, with the vocal cords. So um, those are nasal sounds. Yeah, and we can also, use the tongue to obstruct the airflow that gives the sound, the, the sound a special quality. Yeah, so we can do all kinds of things with consonants. And the big difference, the big division among consonants is we have voiced consonants like d as in dolphin and voiced, voiceless consonants like p as in penguin. And um, yeah, a voiced, S sound as in um, zuzi and a voiceless sound as in nas. And then there are vowels. Vowels are sounds where there's no additional noise. All vowels, unless we whisper, and we're not talking about whispering right now, 
um, all vowels have voice. And the difference among vowels is dependent on what you do with the oral cavity. You can adjust the shape and the size of the oral cavity with the help of your jaw, your lip, uh, your tongue, and your lips. So we can open up our mouth as in English a eh, in black, or we can close it and say blue or German bla, um, hood, hood. So we can purse our lips as in German Mühle, um, or we can relax the lips as in Suppe. Uh. So the shape of our lips is important. The, the degree to which we open our mouth is important and mouth opening is controlled by the jaw. The position of the tongue, uh, the different parts of the tongue is important. When we have a front vowel, the tip of the tongue is the interesting um, folk is the interesting um, is an interesting point um, for consideration because the tip of the tongue can be high up towards the palate or it can be at the bottom of the mouth and so we have various ways in which we can shape the oral cavity and that determines the quality of the vowel sounds. And then we can combine vowel sounds. We can, um, and, and that those combined sounds where one sound melts into another one, those are called diphthongs or diphthongs. Both pronunciations are possible. Okay, so it's not so important to know these terms. It's just important for you to really be aware of where you produce sounds in your mother tongue and where you produce sounds in German or English. Because when we know how and where we produce a sound or where we're supposed to produce a sound, then we can hear the sound better when others pronounce it for us. And we can also work on our pronunciation. You know, some people are very musical and physically fit and they can in intuitively imitate or mirror what somebody else is doing and but not everybody can do that and the older we become the more difficult that becomes for us so it's really helpful to know what's happening and then we can practice that on purpose and then make it yeah bring it into our our subconscious or intuition or what what whatever Okay, so these are the organs of speech and related items, and I will just read them to you. Lips, teeth, alveolar ridge, a bump behind the teeth, palate, velum, uvula, larynx, vocal cords, glottis. Glottis is the space between the vocal cords. The glottis is closed when the vocal cords come together and buzz, and it's open when the air escapes through them and doesn't make them vibrate. And then there's the upper jaw and the lower jaw and the windpipe, a fancy name for that is trachea or trachea. Okay, I already told you that there are vowels and diphthongs and um, consonants. So vowels, diphthongs and consonants are the three types of sounds that exist in German and in English. German and English um, developed out of the same Germanic language, ultimately. And um, so there are many, many similarities and then also many differences. But I think it's very interesting to compare and contrast the two languages. Okay, now um, parameters for describing consonants. The number one is voicing. I already spoke about that. So do we have vo a voiced or a voiceless sound? Do we have a t or a d, for instance? T as in tiger and t as in dolphin, d, 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 or dog. The place of articulation is where the, where the sound is produced. For instance, a b, a b, b, b as in bear or bea, is produced with the two lips. So the lips um, 
are the happening place. And then the manner of articulation refers to the type of um, noise we make. So when we stop the airflow, then it's called a plosive or a stop. When we squish the airflow, it's called a fricative or a sibilant. When we um, close off the oral cavity and let the airflow escape through the nose, and that's called a nasal sound. So um, we see that when we, for instance, when we have the sound mm, as in mom, the place of articulation is the lips. The manner of articulation is that it's a nasal because that indicates that we close off the airflow and let the air escape through the nose. Okay, so here are all the places of articulation for consonants, lips, teeth, alveolar ridge, palate, velum and glottis. And sometimes there are combinations of places. For instance, when we have the, um, the English word frog or German frosch, you see the upper teeth touch the inside of the lower lip and then, um, so that's the, the we have a, a labiodental location. It's a labiodental sound. And then if it's, and for frog or frosh, it's voiceless, there's no buzzing. The buzzing sound begins on the fur, on the, on the R for both languages, frosh and, and then frog. R, r. Um, yeah, so this is cool to keep in mind. Again, there won't be a test. This is just to give you an idea to create awareness of where sounds are produced. And then it's so good to compare and contrast English and German and your mother tongue. Okay, here, um, these are the manners of articulation. My nose started itching, excuse me, please. So we can stop the airflow, then we have a plosive or a stop. We can squish the airstream, then we have a fricative or a sibilant. We can actually combine stopping the airflow and squishing it. That's what happens in the English word chimp, chimp, chimp or giraffe. We have a stop and then a squish and then a sibilant and the combination is ch ch train, chimp, chimpanzee. Um, then, um, or in the German word, Sieg, tss, tss, that's a, a combination of the t uh, sound and the s sound, tss, tss, Sieg. Laterals are um, sounds where I, um, I use the tongue to impede the airflow but the airflow can escape along the side of the tongue. Sometimes also um, above the tip, but mainly along the sides. L when I say lion, l or Löwe, l. A glide or semi-vowel is a sound where we almost have no constriction of the airflow, but there is very uh, a little bit. Um, a good example is the English sound woo, as in wow, a wagon, and um, also what we hear in ye, yes, and German jagua, ye. And then nasals are, as I said, the sounds that are produced with the oral cavity being closed off and the airstream escaping through the nose. Okay, here's the same in German. So again, it's not important that you know these terms, but just in case you want to know them, plosives are Verschlusslaute. Schließen is to close. Verschluss is um, a, um, any way of closing something off. Like a, a Reißverschluss is a zipper. It's a, a way of closing a jacket with the zipper, Reißverschluss. Ein Reibelaut is a fricative for sibilant. Um, it's a fricative, actually. It's Reiben is to create friction, to rub. So it's a rubbing sound. It's a fricative. It's a fricative. Verschluss, Reibelaut, is this affricate combination of plosive and fricative. 
Seitenlaut ist um, a lateral. Seite means um, side. Gleitlaut is the glide, where it's we have this flowing, and we don't feel really any constriction, but there is a little bit of brushing up of the air along some obstacle. And then the nasenlaut is the nasal, so the air goes out through the nose, so it's a nasenlaut, nasal. Okay, so when we describe vowels, we think about, okay, how much, how, how far is my mouth open? Where is my tongue? Is the, the, and the interesting places are the tip and the center of the tongue and the back of the tongue. Um, and then are my lips rounded or not? Of course, there are, you know, you can control many muscles. I actually wasn't aware that you could control the muscle muscles covering your palate but i realized when i taught english and german that you actually have quite a bit of control um, and the thing is for each language you need different kinds of muscles and different combinations of muscles and so you actually need to practice bringing your mouth into the proper position so learning a new language is really learning to hear it and learning to feel it and training the muscles to engage in new activities and to and to um, do engage in new cooperations. Yeah, so when we ask for vowels, we say which part of the tongue is the happening place, the, the front, the center, or the back. Um, how far do you open your mouth? Is it is your mouth closed almost, like in, in green or pink? Or is it very much open like in black? And a little note, um, German doesn't have completely open sounds. I used to think we do, but um, comparing English and German, I realized we don't ever totally open up. Um, and that's very interesting when you teach English to Germans because when they're supposed to say black or bad, they find it hard to drop their jaw. Um, okay. Okay, that was long, but um, I think it's very important to create awareness both about um, how important pronunciation is and where and how sounds are produced. It, it will make learning German easier. And I think I will take a break now and the next video will open up with a description of German consonants. So I hope you liked this video. If you like it, liked it, give me a thumbs up, please. That would make me happy. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.